We're now going to head to our first stop, Norman House. Please refer to the map included in your brochure for the route. The courtyard containing the remains of the Norman House is accessed via a doorway on stone gate marked with a plaque above the door. If the door is locked, a key can be obtained from the office of the Church of St. Michael of Belfry, next to the Minster. Once in the courtyard, stop to listen about the Norman House and the early Jewish community in York. In a city as ancient and rich in heritage as York, the remains of any building that claims to be the oldest of its kind is always impressive. But it is only in the last century that the remains of the oldest house in York is having its time in the sun, literally, as for hundreds of years these ancient stones had been hidden away, their existence forgotten to everyone. This house was built between 1170 and 1180. It is also in this period that we have the first evidence of Jewish settlers in York. As the only surviving example of Norman domestic stonework that remains in its original location, this building is hugely significant. It is all that now remains of York of the late 12th century boom in stone construction amongst the burgeoning merchant and administrative classes. This social category would have included the wealthy members of the Jewish community in York who were enjoying a period of growing prosperity under the reign of Henry II. In this period, the wealthy were building in stone on a scale unseen before. Stone was at the top of the building material hierarchy, being the most expensive material. As it is often said, stone meant status. Stone houses such as this were built with a large hall on the first floor, the floor level of which you can still see in the line of red stone remaining on the right-hand wall. This was used as living quarters, while an undercroft below was used for storage. Although construction in stone increased throughout this period, the vast majority of urban dwellings would still have been built in timber, and so considerably sized stone houses such as this would have stood out as grand, impressive buildings belonging to an individual of some status. As such, stone houses belonging to f Jewish owners often became the focus of anti-Semitic aggression. Chroniclers speak of angry mobs in Westminster being unable to penetrate into their, the Jews, strongly fortified stone houses so they set fire to the straw roofs. Some scholars now think that perhaps Jewish housing has tended to be associated with stone because of the protection it afforded its inhabitants. Meanwhile, in York, the 1190 attacks on the Jewish community began with an attack on and torching of the leading Jew Benedict's house on Spen Lane. The chronicler William of Newborough records of Benedict and Josque that with profuse expense they had built houses of the largest extent in the midst of the city, which might be compared to royal palaces, and there they lived in abundance and luxury, almost regal, like two princes of their own people. It is clear in accounts such as these that the luxurious living quarters of the leading members of the Jewish community became a site of resentment for anti-Semitic prejudice. Although not all Jews could afford to live in such grand stone houses, Jewish housing was nonetheless exclusively urban in the medieval period. The Jewish community in York consisted of around 150 to 200 people in the late 12th century. They all lived close to the principal commercial areas of the city that provided their income. We can see from records that the Jewish community was carrying out a whole range of different jobs and trades in York, occupations such as pawnbroking, peddling, physicians, landlords, moneylenders, scholars and coin minters. Our main source of evidence for the Jewish community in the 12th century comes from the national taxation records, the Pipe Rolls. The first mention of a Jewish community in York comes in 1176 to 1177. We know the York community of the later 12th century had very, very strong links with the Jewish community in Lincoln. 
In fact, York's Jewish community probably started as an outpost of the Lincoln community. These close links can be seen in the career of Aaron of Lincoln, who, between 1166 and 1186, was one of the dominant figures in the Jewish community in England. In 1170, we can see two individuals, Benedict and Joske, working in York on Aaron's behalf. It is only on Aaron's death in 1186 that these two individuals emerge from his shadow to become the major financiers and moneylenders in the north of England. There are also architectural links between the two cities. The nearest surviving counterpart to the Norman House is that of the so-called Jews House in Lincoln, which has been linked with medieval Jewish ownership. The surviving window of the Norman House is almost identical to that in Lincoln, and both houses were built around the same time. It would seem likely that this style of housing was enjoyed by Benedict and Joske in York. So the 12th century was a period of growing prosperity for the Jewish community, not only in York, but in the other cities that they settled in. The fact that we have records of Jewish housing widely scattered throughout the city of York might suggest a lack of tension with the wider community. Jews lived, for example, in Corny Street, in Walngate, and in Pavement. Although the Norman House is likely to have belonged to the church, as its position near the Minster suggests, it still provides an impression of the housing that would have belonged to leading Jewish individuals, attesting to the growing prosperity of the community in 12th century York.